Good morning and welcome to my father's place. I have a question for you today, and it's the title of my message, and it is, Are You Content? But it's not necessarily what you think. Well, first of all, I must give praise and honor and glory to God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. I'm not even in prayer yet. I'm just giving praise to him because he is the one who rescued me from the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. And so I'm very thankful to him. And I'm also thankful for my leadership. We had a lovely time at Holy Convocation. That's why I didn't preach this past Friday. And it was just so encouraging and confirming. We were with saintly ones, as Jeff said. And it was altogether lovely, because the Lord is altogether lovely, and when we are all together, indeed, it is lovely. So, all that said, are you content? I'm going to pray now. Father, you are so kind to your servant. I pray that you would extend your hand to those today who are content not in your way, that they would reach your hand which is extended to them and that they would grab hold of you and find peace in every circumstance. Oh Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you paid a huge price, and I am the beneficiary. A huge price, greater than we will ever be able to comprehend. You did that for everyone on the planet, that whosoever would come to you, would receive your gracious gift of life eternal and salvation from God's wrath. Holy Spirit, have your way with this message. May it go in. May it convict. And may it transform in Jesus' name. Amen. We live... I don't have to tell you this, but I will. We live in troublous times. In troubled times, we don't know what's going to happen next. The headlines could scare you. They could. Well, well, if there had been headlines in Paul's day, They would have read, we're going to get you, Paul. We're going to do all kinds of things to you. We're going to try to kill you. We're going to come behind you and tell everybody a false gospel instead of the real thing. He lived in troubled times, believe me, where there was all kinds of idolatry everywhere, including among the Jews. But in Philippians 4, verse 11, here is what, Paul says. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Though the headlines against Paul were troubling, by anyone's standard. He was content in every single circumstance. So what does it mean? And how did he get there? In these days, we as the church must be there. How do you get there? And what's the purpose? I want to tell you first what the world's definition 
of content is. And this is from Webster's. Content means happy enough with what you have and not desiring more or anything different. Satisfied. That isn't the kind of contentment that Paul has. And now the Greek word in this passage for content means this, self-sufficient, with the idea of adequacy, needing no assistance. Well, Paul would say of these definitions, may it never be. May it never be. But this is the Greek and this is, but you have to understand Paul. That's what, this, that's what this was written in Greek, and Greek, that's self-sufficient. But that's, you don't understand Paul if you think self-sufficiency is what he had. So I'm going to help you understand him. See, he is content, regardless of his circumstances, and what were his circumstances. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 4, verses 10 through 13, and just go down a list of what Paul had for circumstances. He was considered a fool. He was considered weak. He was considered without honor. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was poorly clothed. He was roughly treated. He was homeless. And he toiled, working with his hands. And he was reviled. And he was persecuted and slandered. And he was thought of as the scum of the earth. The dregs of all things. But that's not all. If you think that's enough for him to be discontented, let me show you. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28. Far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked, a night and a day in the deep, frequent journeys, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, he says, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold, and exposure, and apart from these external things, there is my very great concern for the churches. So, isn't that enough for him to be discontent? No. As if that wasn't enough. The letter to the Philippians, which I read from at the beginning, was written by Paul while he was in a Roman prison, which is nothing like the prisons we have today. It was cold, it was damp, it was full of vermin. And yet he writes this letter of joy. How can he do that? How can he be content? Doesn't make any sense. And that's not all, go to Acts 16. You think you've got it tough, ha! Huh? I'm going to read down through. My goodness, my goodness. Listen to this. The crowd rose up together against them, that is he and Silas, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods, 
When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison, that would be the dungeon, and fastened their feet in the stocks. But they were content. How could that be? Listen. Verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. How could that be? What is this contentment that he has? It certainly isn't self-sufficiency. They weren't doing very well. It certainly isn't being satisfied with where you are. Let me tell you. What is the purpose? There's a kingdom purpose in the kind of contentment that Paul has. A kingdom, a kingdom purpose. See, this isn't just so you can feel good, beloved. It is for the kingdom of God because in all kinds of circumstances you have his peace. Glory to God. Oh my goodness. What was it? He said, I, had, I have learned to be content. What does that mean? I have learned to be content. What does content mean? It's different than those other definitions I gave you at the first. My goodness. Kingdom purposes. The advancement of the kingdom of God happens through the kind of contentment that Paul had. Beloved, Paul and Silas were filled with the Holy Spirit. And being filled with God, with God's love, with God's power, with God's peace, with all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They learned by experiencing as they walked full of the Holy Spirit. That's what learned means. An experience of. Not studying real hard, but experiencing just by walking, by going out, by going out in the power of the Holy Spirit. They learned this, not that they are self-sufficient, but they are Christ-sufficient. Christ-sufficient. That is, his grace, which is the divine influence on the heart and the reflection in the life. His grace is sufficient, for his power is revealed in our weakness. It is revealed, it is completed, and it is perfected in our weakness. In his own strength, Paul could not have withstood all that happened to him. But see, the whole purpose was for all of his persecutors to say, how does he do it? We beat him up and left him for dead. We, we stoned him and left him for dead. And he, he gets up the next morning and travels. What? Kingdom purposes. So, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, like Paul and Silas, you know you are Christ-sufficient. And you know that your adequacy comes from Him. In 2 Corinthians 3, and the end of 2, he says, well, let's go there. 1 Corinthians. I mean, 2 Corinthians 3. Starting with 2.16. For to the one, an aroma from death to death, to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? We aren't adequate for any of this, he says. But, in 3.5 he says, 
not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our ad adequacy is from God. So not only did he know he was Christ sufficient, and not only do you know that if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, beloved, you know you are Christ sufficient, and you know your adequacy is not in yourself but in him. And you know you must seek Christ's assistance in every circumstance, because you fully know by experience that just as he says in John 15, 5, you can do nothing apart from him. So do you see the difference between self-sufficient and not needing assistance and adequate in yourself and what Paul had? That's the kind of contentment Paul and Silas and every Holy Spirit-filled believer has. That kind of contentment, and that kind of contentment, well, let me show you what happens with that kind of contentment and what will happen to the church and to you, individual believer, if you all get filled with the Holy Ghost. What happened when they were imprisoned in Acts 16, go back there with me, What happened, and I'm going to interpret this, they were praying in verse 25 of Acts 16 about midnight in the darkest, darkest, darkest part of the night, in the deepest dungeon, their feet in stocks, beaten with wooden rods, stripped. Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Oh, church, oh, Christian, if you are filled with the same kind of contentment that Paul had, you will be able to do this even before your persecutors. It won't make any difference what they do, throwing you in jail for telling the truth that is in this word won't bother you a bit. You will be there singing praises because you know in yourself you're nothing. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You are Christ sufficient. Your adequacy comes from him and you will praise and what will happen. Captives will listen. What? How can these people be praising? They're being persecuted. How can this be? And suddenly there was an earthquake. A great earthquake. So that in verse 26, the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. Ha! There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. They were singing praises. The prisoners were listening. Then this great shaking, do you think, do you think that if you get this kind of contentment by being filled with the Holy Spirit and God's love, do you think that the prisoners might just be freed through a great shaking? They might. Oh, church. Oh, Christian. I guarantee they will. Immediately. There won't be a delay. Your altars will be filled. Those of you who still believe in altar calls. Your altars will be filled with people who say, I want to be with you. Whatever you've got, I want to have it. Everyone's chains were unfastened. How many people do you know who have chains, the homeless people on the corners, 
the drug addict preparing to give himself another high. The criminal who just can't seem to stop doing evil. I tell you, great shaking. That's what will happen, O oh Christian and O oh church. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will have this kind of absolute dependence on Christ that gives you his power in your weakness. Glory to God. That's what it's all about. So that prisoners are set free. That is kingdom work. That can't be done as long as you are self-sufficient and adequate in yourself and needing nothing. Then, not only do the prisoners get out of prison, but they stay. I tell you, prisoners will stay with your church if by the power of God in you, their chains are broken. As long as no chains are broken and everyone goes out just the same way they came in, forget it. They won't stay. But if chains are broken, they will say, God is with you. Even your jailer, if you are in a place of persecution like many martyrs around the world are even today, even jailers get converted to Christianity through the evidence in the life of the one who is imprisoned for faith, for faith in Jesus Christ, they will see how is it that this one can praise and pray under these circumstances. Now this jailer in this passage was ready to kill himself because if the prisoners got free and escaped, his uh, punishment from the Romans. He was a Roman, but he would be punished with death for himself. So he was ready to commit suicide instead of die their way. But Paul said, we're all here. We haven't gone anywhere. Listen, can you imagine how blown away the jailer was by that? What? All the doors are open and you didn't go anywhere? Do not harm yourself, verse 28, for we are all here. And the jailer called for light. So if the church would call for the light, if they would call for, if they would just wait and tarry, if they would have a service that is a tarrying service that lasts till whenever, and all you do is lie there on the floor and cry out to God. Oh my, if there were such a tarrying service, the result would be light, even for those who jail others. Doesn't have to be a physical jail. It can be that one person is captive to another, subservient to another, to the point where they are abused by that other. That, too, is a prison. And that, too, is a jailer. But when he saw what had happened, he came in fear and trembling, and he said, what must I do to be saved. And believe me, if you stop relying on yourself and your programs and your bounce houses and your circuses and your really good musicians and you seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you have his contentment, I tell you what. Many will cry, what must I do to be saved? How can you, in these troubling times, be content? Because I'm not depending on myself. That's why. Here's the one who will make you content so you 
your contentment is revealed to others and they say, well, what must I do to be saved? They see people set free and they say, what must I do to be saved? Do you see, church, what will happen if you stop depending on your programs? Hallelujah. Your programs, not his. You see, self-sufficiency, just as it was for Israel in the Old Testament, is a sin against God. Why? Because God is the source of all strength, not you. And his strength far surpasses yours. So when you say, I'm strong enough on my own, you're rebelling against him. And that is sin. But, beloved, if you ask him to change you today, he'll do it. If you repent from your self-sufficiency, O oh church, O oh Christian, he will give you exactly what you need, which is to be filled with God so you know everything comes from him and he is your sufficiency and he is your adequacy and he is the one you go to for assistance. Glory to God. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. What will happen to you, O oh church and O oh Christian, if you go from complacent to content with Paul's kind of contentment? What will happen to you, O oh church and O oh Christian, if you go from passive to possessed? Oh my, oh my, my, oh my. Then you will become what Christ wants and commands you to be, filled with him and entirely dependent upon him for his strength and his love and his joy and his peace, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, his faith, his gentleness, and his spirit's control beat you hands down. Hallelujah. This sin of self-sufficiency is throughout the church. Like I said before, Brother Yun came and he said, you don't need more church buildings, you need revival. Because all those church buildings were built in our insufficiency. Even great churches, huge churches, there were demographics done for Rick Warren's church. He readily admits he did demographics to determine where exactly he should put his church. God wasn't in that. I'm not saying he doesn't know the Lord, but I'm saying he's working in his own sufficiency. If you turn, beloved, prisoners are going to get set free. That is kingdom work. That advances the kingdom of God. And in every circumstance, regardless of the level of persecution, and believe me, it's coming, regardless of the level of persecution in this country that you endure, you will be singing praises at the top of your lungs and praying in a dungeon with your feet in stocks. And in all the other circumstances, Paul enumerated for us. See, you really, really can't set others free unless you're free. You can't freely give unless you have freely received. And today, this is my altar call. Freely receive. Ask the Lord to do what only he can do to rid you of your self-sufficiency and adequacy and needing no assistance. Let him do it. Ask him. 
You can go on. He will let you go on. He let me go on for the longest time in New Age. He let Jeff go on for the longest time in atheism. But then there was a turning. Turn today. Don't wait. Time is short. Repent. Ask the Lord to fill you so that you have the kind of contentment Paul and Silas did. And look at the witnesses that they were of God's power and God's sufficiency through Christ. My content. I have learned. I have experienced. I know completely by experience that I am able to be content in every circumstance. You will be able to say that if you will turn now. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you your desire is to take us from our self-sufficiency and into Christ's sufficiency. You've made me a watchman, and that's what I see for today. Jesus, this is to build up your church. May those who know you fully and experience this contentment be encouraged by this word, and may those who do not be challenged by it. Holy Spirit, go forth. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.